Okay, thanks David. Well, Bruce Willis is actually a really good starting point for this talk because you've got to have a space launch to start. And I don't have one of higher boosts, so... Ten, nine, So did you get that? Gonna, this is going to unlock the mysteries of the solar system's origin. And how might you well ask, would we do such a thing? This is uh, what it was heading towards. This is, oops, I forgot to delay them. So this is a, um, this is what 300 kilograms of copper travelling at a relative velocity of about 10, 15, 20 kilometres per second sort of does to a comet. And so the whole argument for this mission was, and this is deep impact, this isn't Hayabusa, the whole argument for this mission was, well, gee, we've got, if we have to stop an asteroid or a comet hitting Earth, we have no idea what the mechanical properties of these objects are. So let's take 300 kilograms of copper and send it out there and smack it into it and see what happens. And so if we, you know, you hear these stories, well, you can't do this because it'll blow up the, the object and, and cause all sorts of fragments to come raining down on the Earth and so forth. But as it turns out, this was deep. You know, uh, if I play this again, you know, that, that was the left hand side. Did you did you see the right hand side? That that's really quite interesting. Oh, go away, come back. So this one on the right hand side is a camera on the 300 kilograms of copper, and so you can see it juddering around and, and carrying on. That's milligram particles hitting the piece of copper, with 300 kilograms, because of the relative velocity it puts it offline. And that's the targeting system dragging it back, little thrusters dragging it back so it makes sure it hits the, the comet. And so the end result, they went back and they had a look at this. This was viewed by Stardust. Stardust is another mission that was out there orbiting around looking at comets. And so they just redeployed it, keep it going, go past Comet Temple in this case, have a look for the crater. Can you see the crater? Well, actually you can't. There is a crater there, which is another story in itself, what a crater is doing on comets. But uh, basically, a 150 metre sized crater was produced by that copper projectile, and basically it's a few pixels. This is a 10 kilometre size object. And so smacking things like 300 kilograms of copper into it with effectively you know, large energy is not going to disrupt one of these objects if it comes back to Earth. So that's, that's just the st a story of, of relative velocities, essentially. What relative velocity does to you in terms of getting there, what it does in terms of landing on an object and then coming home again is all very difficult and highly energy intensive. And so the Hayabusa mission is a, a kind of gentler mission out into the cosmos. It's going to an asteroid and back. Uh, it, it was a technology demonstration for, for JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. So this is their attempt to, to visit another object in the solar system and bring back a sample. So nobody's really done this in this way before to actually land on an object, so Hayabusa means falcon, and the idea is that the, the, the spacecraft hovers above the asteroid and comes down, grabs a sample, and then goes back up. So it's, it's behaving very similar to, to the falcon, and there it is as a, an artist's conception of what happened in that bottom frame down there. So why do we want to go to asteroids? Don't meteorites come from asteroids? Well, yes, they do. But uh, there's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of justifications for this. A, it's a technology demonstration. Did I mention that? So basically they want to go out and they want to establish themselves in that field. So an asteroid is useful in this, in this context. So the scientific rationale could go along something like this. Infrared imaging of asteroids suggests different types of asteroids are out there. Spectroscopically we see different minerals, we see different reflectance and so forth. And so we're, we're seeing the, the surface of the asteroids uh, as we look out there. And these are the, the you know, it's, it's, you know, this is lumpers versus splitters in science. So you get scientists who try to lump things together and then you get splitters who try to tear them apart and make different categories. So this is the, the first one of the first attempts of lumping and splitting for asteroids. So they start on off with three categories, of course, SC and unknown. And then it, you know, Next attempt, some PhD student gets involved and suddenly there's 26 different classifications of, of asteroids. But anyway, we, we digress. So 
So the, the issue here is that the S-class asteroids are 17% of asteroids and they have some features which are related to olivine and pyroxene, so not shooting myself in the eye. So S-type here, few features here. These look as though they're olivine and pyroxene features. C-type down here, very flat, very black, low reflectance. And they're the most common type of asteroid and there's no features in the spectrum. So if you look at meteorites, what we see on Earth, chondrite meteorites, and so these are the ordinary chondrites. This is an ordinary chondrite up the top here, so it's composed of iron, magnesium, silicates with a, a little bit of matrix in there. And so this is the, the most, the commonest type of stony meteorites, about 85%. We also have carbonaceous chondrites, which are rare, less than 5% of them, and they're, they're sort of black because they have more matrix in them compared with these two, and there's a few other subtle differences, but by and large, that's the major difference. The problem is that these will be the, the equivalent of the, the S chondrites, and this will be the C chondrites, but their abundance is around the wrong way, so what's going on here? And so this brings into question, well, can we actually use spectrographic uh, imaging of asteroids to tell us about meteorites? And, well, you know, we, we can make arguments as to why we've got different abundances, but it'd be much nicer to go there and, and assure ourselves of, of what's going on. So meteorites do sample asteroids, but there's some issues with what we have for meteorites versus what we have uh, uh, out in space. And the primary thing is that they, they tend to lose their surface very quickly because they're coming in at at least 11 kilometres per second, the escape velocity of the Earth, and that skin just gets ablated away. So everything we wanted to see for asteroids we can't see in, in meteorites, for example. And there's, there's really only a, a few determinations of where meteorites are coming from, so they're getting more common. So there's, there's various networks out there which are observing asteroids, and then some of those are actually on collision courses with Earth and so they actually follow them all in so they know where it came from and then they can go out and pick up a piece and oh this is where this has come from in this part of the, of the asteroid belt. But it's sort of a little bit serendipitous, we still don't have close up of, of images of the sources and we still don't have those, we want to see those skins in the, in the laboratory as well. So again this is a, a technology demonstration so Earth crossing asteroids are, are within reach and there's a relatively low delta V and so you don't need a lot of fuel to get out there. So Hayabusa is a, a technology demonstration music mission and it's, the, it's an asteroid sample return, it's going to touch and go, 510 kilogram spacecraft of this sort of uh, rather aerodynamically shaped refrigerator design. It's about the same sort of size as this, maybe doubled up a little bit. 510 kilos is a fair bit of it. It was launched on uh, 9th of May 2003, fairly uneventfully, and its target was, what is its discovery term was 1998 SF36, and this was subsequently renamed 25143 Itakawa, Itakawa being the father of, uh, of uh, rocket science in, in Japan. So Itakawa is in an Earth-crossing orbit, and so down here we have the Earth down here in green and we have Itakawa in blue and so the mission plan was to, to sort of head off from Earth and so the launch is up here and so it heads off and does uh, a full lap and then flicks off round uh, on the, the other orbit. And so this is a sort of a non-Keplerian plan and it's non-Keplerian because it's basically designed that you get into your, your rocket ship and you basically drive with the excessive acceleration of one millimetre per second squared and pick up the, the velocity or, or decrease, the velo decrease the velocity necessary to get into orbit this, with this thing and match it. And so it has autonomous control. We're using the, they use guidance from the stars initially and then uh, once they locked onto it, guidance directly from Itakawa to, to actually get there. So there are three aspects of this which are the, the, the new bits, the technology for, the, for JAXA, the iron engines, the autonomous control and then the Earth, Earth return and of course this hasn't been done that many times uh, bringing back samples from, from outer space. We have samples of the Sun, samples from uh, a, a comet which sort of come in along these sort of lines and of course we have the, the Apollo missions bringing back lunar samples. So the journey, flawless launch, on the way things start going wrong and so they lost two of their three gyroscopes and this caused great consternation to the Japanese because these were the only things on board that were not Japanese. They actually bought them from the Americans and so they blamed the Americans for this. 
And so the gyroscopes are designed, obviously, to, to keep the, the, the spacecraft balanced. And so you have three wheels spinning around and, and three orientations, and that will keep it oriented wherever you want to go, and you can just use the momentum off the flywheels to reorient, your, particularly your solar panels towards the sun and your antennas towards the Earth. And so this is a real problem. Uh, they were left with one gyro plus the, the stabilisation from, from acceleration, the force you can generate from the iron engines. So they were, they were down to basically a position where the loss of the third gyro would, would effectively kill the mission. You couldn't actually control it after that. But essentially it survived. The iron engines were a total success. They worked per, uh, perfectly. And the guidance worked. And so it arrived in, in, uh, at Itikawa in September of 2005. And so the idea is to, to, to sort of, once they got there, sort of, okay, let's have a look, catch our breath, see what we're, we're doing. And so they, they uh, used the chemical thrusters to stabilise the orbit at about 10 kilometres above and then uh, undertook a series of observations and experiments. And you've probably seen images of it. It's a, um, the, the first 500, first rubble pile asteroid. They've been sort of, um, been sort of conjectured that you should actually see this. So this is a, the tailless debris of, uh, of asteroids and so rather than having a, a, a good solid you know, chondrite or something like this, this is actually debris material. And uh, it looks as though it was originally two objects, and you can sort of see one big object here, sort of round, and it's merged with this one here, and then there's this bit in here, which is uh, uh, sort of the collision material, and uh, of course the, the Japanese immediately started drawing diagrams on this and turned it into an otter. And so, this began, and so you, you start talking about the head of the otter and the whiskers, and then... The, the pores and so forth and so it took on a life of its own and of course this is really good for public um, imagery for, for everybody but it's a fantastic object you know look at this boulder sitting on the end of it it's, it's sort of roughly about 10% the length of the whole thing so this is 500 metres long or thereabouts and so you've got these big boulders sticking up there you've got very and you can see different terrains you've got a very rubbly coarse terrain and you've got a lot of smooth terrain and here, and so there's a lot going on even in, the, in, in this sort of a rubble pile. And one of the big things that they like to, you know, people like to do is, is do shape models, and so that, you know, this is uh, based on the LIDAR, the, the laser interferometry imaging, and so putting it all together to create a, a shape model which is rotating around its axes. You can see one of the issues for, for this object is the way it rotates every 12 hours, it's sort of rotating about a very strange mid position and wobbling around, and so if you you're trying to land on it, this is a, a bit of a consideration. And uh, it was more, and I'll, I'll jump to it straight away, it was more consideration than they, they realised because they had this little um, object here which is called Minerva and you can see these little prongs sticking out, these are electrostatic prongs, so the, the idea is that this thing has a camera on board and you, you throw it onto the surface and then you take photos and then you know, flick your cockroach prongs and away it goes on to somewhere else and takes some more photos. But when they tried to launch it and, and send it down onto Itakawa, the problem was that the, the, the PI who was responsible for saying, you know, launch, sort of delayed a little bit too long as he was considering his, his, uh, his deployment and basically missed. And so it was dropped off and you can see it's all, you know, effectively Itakawa just sort of rotated out of the way and Minerva sailed off into uh, solar orbit basically. So these are some of the experiments that were done. I'm not going to dwell on these. There's uh, infrared imaging, um, X-ray, uh, infrared spectrometry, which is it's very useful in terms of comparing asteroids with, with, with you know, what you see in space with what we see on Earth versus what we're going to get back in the, in the laboratory. Uh, the X-ray spectrometer, uh, using the sun's X-rays to try and excite electrons and so forth. A laser interferometry for actually doing the shape models and um, getting everything going and the LIDAR and landed, but we don't care about any of those because we're interested in the landing. And I, I was in Japan for the, for the committee meeting, okay, we're, go, we're going to decide where we're going to land on, on, the, on uh, Itakawa. And of course, the geologist sees something like this, this nice smooth terrain and this nice rubbly terrain, and what do you want to do? You want to sample both of those terrains. Then you get into this... You know, continuous fight between scientists and engineers. The engineers are saying, no, you can't do that. We're not going to let you get anywhere near that rubbly terrain because you'll basically jeopardise the mission. If it hits one of those rocks, we're, we're stuffed. We can't get it back. And so there's, you, know, you get the feeling that the engineers didn't really want to land. It's just that it was one of their technology demonstration points that was the only reason 
they were going to allow us to take their precious spacecraft anywhere near that horrible rocky object which doesn't deserve to be in space anyway. So the, the compromise was that we, at our selection committee meeting we were given point A to choose. So we chose point A. <laughs> so what happens when you land? The, this is what's meant to happen. The Itakawa comes down and so it's, you see that down at the bottom here there's this big horn and so the, the horn has a little mirror on it and there's a laser up on the spacecraft and when it touches it def deforms the horn and the the laser picks up, ooh, I can't see any more laser light, I must have hit something, therefore I will fire a bullet into the, into the, into the uh, asteroid, not, not to kill it, but to stir it up a little bit, and get it up the horn and into the sample chamber. So the debris is meant to travel up the horn, the container gets sealed, sealed away, and then you fly away. And all this is meant to take, you know, of the order of a couple of seconds at the most. So it comes down, fairly low velocity, maybe, you know, half a metre per second or something, touches, deforms, bang, bang, off you go. So very delicate sort of, very much like a, a falcon, peregrine falcon. So, what happened? Alright, so they initiate the approach and so what they, coming in directly from behind the sun and coming down onto the surface, that's about 10 kilometres away, as you get closer you can see what they do is, they managed to succeed this time in throwing off the the target marker down onto the surface. Why they didn't just aim for the middle of the rotation axis from manoeuvres beyond me, but anyway, um, they could trace down the, the, the little reflective, you know, triangle reflector thing over for, for tracing it down, and you can see the spacecraft coming down, and that's all very well and good. And remembering that this is, you know, maybe several light minutes away from, from the Earth, you really don't have any control. This is all being done autonomously by the spacecraft itself. So the protocol is set up, this is what you do, and bang, 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 it's all going to go, and then we're just going to get the report. So the last uh, image is from about 200 metres, and unfortunately they didn't have a close-up camera on the back end of this thing, they just had the telescopic camera, so 200 metres away was the best uh, image we actually got of the surface. But it's not too bad anyway. So came down, and basically it stopped at an elevation at about plus 17 metres. And so you, you're sort of getting there in control, okay, we're getting ready to come down and hold on, it stopped. So what happened? And so they, they, we, we actually sat around and talked about it for at least half an hour, 45 minutes, and it's like, well, you know, it stopped, there's only one other thing in the room here, it hit the asteroid, you're just out. Same reason you missed with Minerva, you, it, it just missed, so it's like, you know, don't worry about it, it's, it's on the surface, just be careful to get the thing off. And so the touchdown was uh, before expected, so the, the software interlock had not been taken off, the gun, because it's a gun, it's dangerous, you can't have a, a gun sort of roaming around the, the solar system without an interlock, without a safety lock on it. And so there's no gunfire on that sample. And so it was decided, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll close off the chamber anyway. Yeah, the, again, there's, you know, we took off and then the, they didn't close the, actually they didn't close the, the chamber immediately and we, we took off back to the gate position and then it's like, well, should we close the cha chamber or not? And it's like, well, what else are you going to do with it? It's like, it may have a sample, it may not, but you'll never know if you don't close it and it's like, why wouldn't you close it anyway? You've got three separate container, you know, capsules to use in, or containers in the sample return capsule, close the thing off, we'll worry about that when we get it back. So eventually that was decided and was closed. So then, okay, you're allowed another touchdown. So if you, the, the one question we didn't answer was what happens if you actually knew you had a sample? Would you risk the spacecraft going down for a second landing? And I suspect they wouldn't. But anyway, so touchdown number two. The engineers were happy with this. So compromise between one and three is two. So down we go. So we start descending and of course we lose communications with it and we wait and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and then what happens? That age old, well not very age old, <laughs> there's a computer, something happened to the computer and there is no longer recording of what it actually did on the surface. So it just wiped the memory, so it's the blue screen of death of, of uh, spacecraft. So we don't, again, we don't know, and 
Then the question could have come up, well, do we risk a third landing because it hasn't worked on possibly on two times? Do we try and do it again? And then, you know, this is a classic, you know, your service is very important to us. So, the problem was that straight after the second uh, and very soon after, I think, I'm not sure if they were coincident or not looking back memory-wise now, but after the second touchdown and the chemical thrusters fired to get it off the surface, it basically, the, the chemical thrusters effectively did not turn off and every chemical thruster on the spacecraft simultaneously vented all of its fuel. And so you've, you've basically taken this poor little spacecraft and it's now tumbling around and doing all sorts of crazy things. And um, so you've got no stabilisation capability, you've got no solar panel aligning to the sun, your antenna has gone, and basically we had two weeks to get it back into the departure window for a return in 2007. And so they come up and say, well, this is, it isn't coming back in 2007, it's going to have to wait. And the Japanese had a really good idea for trying to, to sort it out. Oops. And that's basically to do nothing. And that is probably the best thing they could have done because the whole point is that it's in a chaotic motion and tumbling and you just can't control it, especially since you can't communicate with it. And so you've missed your return window. The next return window is in 2007 to get back. And so they basically said, we're going to leave it. And they just said, we don't have to worry about this. It's going to take care of itself. And so the idea is that you, you leave it to tumble. It's got these big solar panels on it and they're flexing and wobbling. And so you, you allow it to self-damp out all the wobbles so that you only have one spin axis you have to deal with. And they could deal with that. And so in 2006, they, they tried to re-establish communications and they got back on with the, the small receiver, the broad, sort of a, a wide angle receiver. And they managed to fairly quickly reorient the solar panels to the sun, reorient the, the antenna to the earth and get Hayabusa back in action. So on that original badge, you'll see, you know, Revival 2006. You know, they, that was a, an incredibly good thing they did to actually recover this, this mission at this stage. And it could have so easily come amok. So the idea is in 2007, we returned to, uh, returned to Earth. So basically, uh, even though they'd recovered it, they just basically, well, we can't do anything for nine months, so we might as well sit here and wait. And so they uh, hired Busa to have another lap of, the, of, the, of the, the sun, basically, to get to a position where you can start decelerating and, and get into uh, Earth recapture in about uh, summer of 2010. And of course, you don't have too many options. It's where they're, they're actually crossing, so it's all very well. To, to, you just can't start anywhere you want to. On the way back, reasonably uneventful, there's some engine neutralizer issues, and so the iron engine, the, 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 was, it's, a, it's a xenon gas that you actually ionise and then you throw the ions out, you can electrostatically accelerate ions out the back and so this is the momentum, so it's a very slow acceleration but it works pretty well. But if you do that and you keep on ejecting positive particles, you end up charging up the uh, spacecraft negatively. So they, they have these neutralizers, which is basically just tungsten filaments, just throwing electrons away to try and keep the, the spacecraft neutral, so to speak. And so the four engines on Hayabusa, they all have their own neutralizers. I found that Engine B was failing, and that, but neutralizer B was good. But uh, engine A was okay, but neutralizer A was falling apart. And so they, they uh, managed to couple, in hindsight, engine A with uh, neutralizer B and bring and keep it going. So again, a, a very good effort from from JAXA. So the the, the target to, to get back to Earth is the the Woomera test range, the prohibited area. Um, it's all very complicated in terms of Australian logistics. You know, politics gets involved. And I, and, and I was involved in the, the Hayabusa Task Force of the Australian Academy of Science and we were liaising with, with JAXA on the possibility of a non-nominal return. In other words, it crashes and spills open and, and collecting the dust up. Now, in that um, scenario, Aquas gets involved and the quarantine service, as soon as you, you know, you're sending out these lovely missions out into the into the cosmos to try and, is there signs of life out there? Well, it better not be because Aquas is going to destroy them pretty damn quick. <laughs> so they were involved. Uh, the Space Policy Unit was responsible for the paperwork. You know, you need paperwork to bring a spacecraft back into Australia. An import licence, and they have, you know, I'll, I'll show you, they have a specific form for it. And then, of course, it's in the prohibited area, so it's under the control of the Australian Air Force, and the guy in charge is in charge. 
nothing anybody else says matters. It's what he says goes. Anyway, it all it all worked out. But this is this is classic. So uh, they put in an application for the return permission in February. So this is this is only a few months before the thing's meant to come back in June. And so JAXA would like to announce that it was issued the classic the Arolso, the authorised return of overseas launch space objects. This is the Australian form for the sample recovery capsule, not not the rest of it aboard the, the asteroid explorer Hayabusa from the Space Licensing and Safety Office, SLAZO, of the Australian Government on February, April 16, 2010. And this is only you know, two months prior to arrival, so I'm sorry, you know, the, the Japanese... You know, it, it was amazing that this thing got through, so all, all congratulations to DISA for, for pushing this through and Minister Carr at the time for, for having signed off on it. So trajectory correction manoeuvre. So th this is rocket science. So you, you're trying to, the idea is that you're trying to bring something back to as small an area as you possibly can. And um, say that's 10 kilometres, you want to put it into a 10 kilometre radius. It's got to hit, and you're coming in 11 kilometres per second, right? You've got to hit the top of the atmosphere within one second of what you think you should be doing. It's not, oh, well, you know, it's five seconds out. Five seconds, it's 50 kilometres downrange. And so this is rocket science and they, they really uh, do a, a phenomenal job of actually controlling these things to this level. So Hayabusa is coming back, it's, it's aiming for Earth somewhere, round about Earth. And so it doesn't matter for a start off, you know. The, and so we asked, the, you know, there's a guy from the Space Policy Unit sitting who was basically des designated to go to Japan and, and sit and make sure it's not going to hit anything of value in Australia. Um, but they were asking questions, and this was in March 2010. Um, you know, uh, where are you actually aiming this thing before you actually bring it in? And so there's, oh yeah, it's somewhere above Earth. You know, don't worry about it; it's not a big deal. And it's like, well, you know, we, it's sort of difficult to tell a minister it's aiming somewhere above the Earth when, you know, everybody would like to know exactly where it is. But anyway, so TCM zero, target above the horizon. So there's, this is before TCM zero. So. So, in fact, they did actually know where they were, and so TCM zero is to bring it down within QE of the of the uh, the horizon, and so TCM one is just a correction to allow for you know, the getting this far down on the targeting. TCM two is to take it to the horizon. Now, did you know that at this stage, TCM two Hayabusa was aimed at Sydney? They didn't tell you that, did they? I was worried about it hitting Adelaide, but actually Sydney should have been far more concerned because. At that TCM2, and if TCM1 had failed, they would have had to do, do something rather special to get get it off uh, position. Probably just drive the engine; it would have been fine, but they would have lost the mission. But anyway, nothing happened too much. So from TCM2 to TCM3, flawlessly under under the centre of the Woomera test area, and as you get closer, TCM4 under the landing area, and then they had another one TCM5 if they needed, and they didn't need it because the, the targeting was flawless. And so the idea is these are the the predictions of where it's going to land, and so these are the error ellipses. This is part of the Woomera test range, and so prohibited area. They, they closed down the highway that night because this is the highway just here in white, so you can see that <laughs> it actually goes covers the highway. So the, 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 the base commander says, no, no problem, we'll just shut the highway down. So he rings up the police, you know, a few, few weeks in advance, obviously. The highway is going to be closed at 10 o'clock through to 2 a.m. in the morning, and it's closed. You, you can't get back through. So, um, and the, there were people waiting to, to get through and so forth. So, if you didn't know what was going on that night, a you would have had a cop pulling you over to the side of the road, and then you would have had whoa, what was that <laughs> coming flying over you? Because you know, you, I think they basically blocked it off down here somewhere, which is still fairly close to the air ellipses. But this is the rocket science aspect of it. You know, this is what they're targeting, trying to target into. And that's as good as they can get, allowing for all of the aerodynamics and the upper atmosphere and the timing and everything else like that. So various models all pointing to that sort of return ellipse. Uh, the, the, the ellipse is actually about 30 kilometres long. So this is about 30 kilometres. So this is Glen Dambo, which is on the highway. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is about 30 kilometres by about 10 or thereabouts. So it's obviously coming in at low angle and therefore you've got a, it's a circle cone which intersects the, the surface of the Earth. Uh, here we do that again. Uh, come on. 
So the Hayabusa return plan, so that the, what's meant to happen is the Hayabusa mothership jettisons the capsule, spits it out down here, and the capsule goes down onto Earth, and then the, um, this, this, this is before TCM0, so then the, 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 the mothership sort of flies on by. So the, the sample return capsule comes in about 12 kilometres per second. It decelerates from the atmosphere, obviously, with its heat shield. They jettison the heat shield. Uh, you get to deploy the parachute, stick on a radio beacon, and um, pick it up. Pretty straightforward stuff. The problem was that now this mission is about three years older than it originally was intended to go. And of course, as every child knows, it's like, what about the batteries? And so, did the batteries survive or not? And this was also an issue for sta the Stardust mission, that the batteries actually got much hotter than they, they thought they were going to. So, you worry about the batteries because the batteries control the jettisoning of the heat shield, they control the, the parachute deployment and the, the radio beacon. So, without those batteries, none of this is going to happen. And if that doesn't happen, then this thing's coming in hot. So, it's going to come in at several hundred kilometres per hour, per hour at, at the lowest sort of speed. Um, as opposed to, to something nice and gentle on a, on a parachute. So the, the problem was that if, if you want to check the batteries in the, in, the, in the sample return capsule, you had to cut the link with the mother craft. And so it's a one-way direction. There's no way of checking the batteries and getting them, the mothership to, to go on. And so they, they basically decided they'll, they'll do the separation at the last possible moment while we can still do communications with the mother craft because we have to jettison, we've got to control the mother craft. And so basically the good thing, good thing, bad thing, and I, we, we spoke to some Japanese kids about this and it's like uh, one of the Japanese kids asked um, um, the, the program director, you know, won't you be very sad when Hayabusa sort of burns up? And it's like, well, and I responded, you know, something along the lines, well, you know, think of it as a phoenix, you know, it's, it's going to burn up so that its sample container can can live again for us scientifically and so they, they were happy with that. But they were really upset that, that Hayabusa was actually going to burn up on the way in. Of course we just see it as a fireworks show, but anyway. Um, not quite. That's a bit flip. But reading or not, it, it's going to come in. So um, on that night, this is the last view they took of the, of the Earth from space before transmission stopped. And they could actually, and NASA was following this thing with, its, with various uh, capabilities, I've been told, that uh, allow you to see these sort of things from rather large distances. And so they were monitoring this as well. So we took off, we decided that um, so there was a lot of observation going to be on the south side. We decided we'd take off to the north side. So that means driving 400 kilometres up to Coober Pedy on the, on the evening. So just in case it was cloudy down there, we'd get a good view from, from the north side. And so it, it was a sort of semi-cloudy day, but it, during the evening it just burnt off quite nicely. And then you could actually, you know, this is just with my horrible camera just sitting on the, the top of the, of, the, of the car, you can actually see the dust lanes in, uh, in uh, the Milky Way and things like that. And we had a, we had a Japanese colleague who had never seen a meteor until that night and he saw a lot. It, it's pitch black out there. So again, this is rocket science. So the guy, one of my colleagues is sitting there with his NASA approved wristwatch counting down. Five, four, Three, two, one. You should see it now. There it is. So that's a good thing in, in the first place. The, the next really, and this is, this is one of my photographs, it's pretty wobbly because it's uh, just a time lapse thing and we're just mucking around with it. But the, the, the really good thing we immediately saw was this is the spacecraft burning up here, but out in front, just a little bit, there's a little object which is the sample return capsule. So as soon as we saw that, it's all on. We know it's, it's going to come in in the right sort of way. And so here's one of the, the TV crew's images of it. So here's the, the ca capsule here. He's trying to lock onto it. And then he'll get onto it and then zoom in. And you can see the little bright mark just underneath it. And that's the sample return capsule. And everything's going on behind it, which is the, uh, the, the mother craft. So it's something like uh, several hundred metres apart, even at this stage. So this is what three hours prior to uh, return does for you. So that goes on and sort of keeps glowing. So all of the, the mother, everything else sort of goes away. And this is just the incandescence of the heat shields as they, they're decelerating. And then as it slows down in the thicker and thicker atmosphere, it starts to, to cool down and, uh, and basically disappears. And we have one from another angle. 
So uh, this is from sort of underneath it, and so you can see the sample return capsule just underneath in this position. So this is the Channel 9 news telecast, which I promise never to use. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, quite spectacular and, uh, and uh, worthy of display. So the mother craft totally burned up. Now, oh, 100, no, that's it's about, I think it starts at about, uh, what, maybe kilometres wise. It's 300,000 feet or thereabouts, so it's, it's, it's not that far above the, the surface of the Earth when you think of it in terms of the Earth diameter and everything else. Um, so what was I... Yeah, so I think that's when it... That sounds familiar, 100 kilometres, when it first hits and then decelerates down. And so NASA was up there with, a, with another uh, DC-8 viewing this as well, getting the incandescence and so forth. And so we were up in Cuba Pedi, and so um, I, you know, sitting out in the middle of the outback sort of looking at meteors and thinking, this is really good. And um, then the phone goes, of course. Why else wouldn't it? So it was BBC, and so they wanted to know an interview, and it's like, go away. We're, you know, we're waiting for the return, and so I'll give you, I'll call me back at midnight because that's you know, it's meant to come in at about 11, uh, 21 p.m. local time. We'll drive back into town and wait, and we'll give you an interview there. And so they, they were happy with that. And so before we actually left Cooper PD after me, and 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 so before we left Cooper PD at midnight, they had confirmation of the of the radio beacon. And so that's the radio beacon of Hayabusa, and so that says the parachutes have opened and so everything's in a good position. Uh, one of the guys, this is from the, one of the guys from the, from the base um, in Tui and he, he's actually written down the coordinates of the, of the landing point because they'd already triangulated it just from their, from their own local stuff and so they knew where it was and so they just phoned around and worked it out. And so before we left Cooper PD they had confirmation of the radio beacon so that the batteries are off, the heat shields are off, the parachute must have opened. Uh, that actually there was a no-fly until 1am. The helicopter wasn't allowed to go out until after that because that was the, the protocol for, for the return and so they, they took off at somewhere around there. They confirmed the... the uh, they sent that back this photograph so that was about 2am or so. By 4am that was all over the press. By 4am we got back into, into Woomer and so then they wanted to start doing interviews for the TV and everything else like that. So. Um, we just carried on and, and did a few interviews with various people uh, associated with the mission. So then the next day is the, is the recovery aspect, and this is the sort of the ground you're looking at re uh, organising a recovery. Uh, this sort of ground's okay, but there's also a lot of salt lakes in this region as well, so the worst possible scenario is this thing's hit into a salt lake, but obviously with that photograph, we knew it hadn't done that, so that's good. The uh, photograph, the helicopter takes back off again, heads out to, to the return site and so this it lands down, you know, the, the most important people who are you know, somebody from the base, the Aboriginal elders, um, who else was on that first one? A reporter. And there's about half a dozen people who are basically extraneous to the whole process as far as we were concerned. And then the second helicopter actually took in the recovery team and the recovery team uh, consisted of including these guys and uh, this guy on the, on the left here is particularly important. You can see how he's dressed for a, for a sort of a winter's day in, in the outback. But it's actually for, because it's got pyrotechnics on it, he's got to clip the wires and make sure it's all disabled, even though we know they've all gone off and everything should be fine. But you know, this is the way things are done in OH&S, so he has to, to go in there first. The guy on the left is now the, uh, the, the program director for the next round of Hayabusa. And he's wearing the, the quarantine matters cap, which had been given to him to get it out there, just to remind everybody if it's broken, <laughs> they're coming to get it. But it wasn't broken. Here it is at the end of its parachute, and it's in really good shape. So the, the, the guys go over there with their, with their chutes, and they take their happy snaps for themselves, trample all over the parachute, and scuff around everywhere, and uh, otherwise muck up the, the area. Uh, this is... Uh, then having a, have a, another look around and then there's close up of this capsule you can see there's actually some red dust on it 
Now, we're not exactly sure if it's then kicked up the red dust or it's basically scraped that as it was, was coming in. We would like to know that, but uh, basically most of this information was effectively lost by the way it had to be done. So to cut a long story short, and of course this takes all day, so it was about an 8am departure originally, and so they're, they're bagging it up here, they've got it in a plastic bag, they're loaded into this, and so uh, into, into a container, take a couple of scrape samples of the soil from around it in case there's some contamination, and then load it into the helicopter for a return back to Woomera, and yeah, fly off fly in and so now you can see that it's, it's sort of twilight so this has taken all day so this is about 5pm at night they have this uh, high grade uh, removal device here for trundling it along back to the base and there was some broken concrete on the way so they had to give up that and carry the thing anyway it doesn't weigh anything so it was sort of bizarre that they had that in the first place so here they are posing for the, for the media shots having brought it back and then it's taken into a clean room to actually set up a a clean room inside the, the Woomera base. Originally we were going to set that up at ANU just in case something went on, but they made the right decision to set it up at, at Woomera, so a totally clean environment to clean off the, the capsule, and here we are having a look at it. We weren't allowed to look at it directly. We had to have a look at, through the plastic, but it's, it's a, a totally pristine condition and worked really well. So I stick it back in a box, off on its way to Tokyo, into the, uh, the sample receiving lab, which is a, a new building purpose built for this and into a purpose-built vacuum chamber. And this is, this, is a, this is a large bit of kit. And uh, this sort of caused a degree of consternation from some of the PIs associated with the, with the, the sample return because that's a lot of money to, to put that much vacuum together. But uh, in effect, it's, it's sort of necessary. You, you know, you've got a one-off one -off chance and they wanted to cover all the bases, so they wanted to see what the noble gases might have been inside the chamber and all this sort of thing. Even though it's in vacuum for how many millions or billions of years, it's, you know, they're, they're going to try it. So there, there's a number of experiments associated with this thing. You can see these big holes here, which are basically allow you to put your hands in with gloves and so forth and do manipulations, and uh, sample insertion rods and so forth. So... Uh, very elaborate sort of um, thing and so eventually uh, it's sort of its preliminary rest position is up in this sort of region here which you can climb up and have a look down into and this is the sort of view you have and this is looking down onto the sample return capsule and there's actually bits of fluff just inside and these are almost certainly associated with the hydrazine chemical thrust is oxidising and this is just debris left over after, after the, um, the, the, the problems with the, the chemical thrusters but the samples are actually inside of that, and so it's, it's not that big of a deal. So we recovery number one. Uh, they opened up one room, and sort of the th first time you open something, you've got to be very careful about it. So they stuck glass rods in and tried to locate things. And this is a glass rod, and it's really hard to see, and it was really hard to see inside the capsule as well. Uh, this is actually the shadow, so the glass rod's actually coming here. You can see some little dark smudge there, and that's a particle. And so they, they went in with glass rods trying to pick up all these particles very gently and got sick of that and then tried the spatula recovery and so you scrape around the inside, what are we going to get? And so this was a, a, one of the releases and so this was very exciting because uh, there's olivine and there's pyroxene here, there's, there's some artefacts which are aluminium grains and that's fine because the inside of the chamber is aluminium and these are just scrape offs, that doesn't matter too much. But olivine, pyroxene, plagioclase, trollite as being minerals on this is is basically exactly what we wanted to see. And so then recovery number three, option number three is to turn it over and smack it on its thumb and see what comes out. And that's where most of the grains actually came from, unbeknownst to me at the time. <coughs> they said something strange had happened but they couldn't tell me. I found out later. So the news release on November the 16th, 2010, we convinced them to make a news release. JAXA has been engaged in collecting and categorising particles that were brought back by Hayabusa. 1,500 grains were identified as rocky particles and most of them were judged to be of extraterrestrial origin. So, lo and behold, everybody... You know, the Japanese were, were, were uh, awarding points for what they, they achieved and so they started off with a scale of 0 to 100, 100% success the mission would have been blah, 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 and blah. By the time we got these, it was up to 500%, so that was a really successful mission. <laughs> So in Japan, in the part of the, um, the initial examination, uh, mineralogy, tomography, oxygen isotopes, noble gases, trace elements, organics, all those neat things you want to do. But of course you want to see the pictures, and these are the, the pictures of the, you know, this is one of the grains, and so 
documentation is important, so you're going to basically, ultimately you're going to release these to the, to the scientific public sort of thing, so you want to tell what they are and so forth, and so this is one of these, this is grain number 10 I think it is, and so a bit of reflected light, a bit of uh, transmitted light and cross polars. Of course the SEM is much better, and so uh, we can reorient this to the same orientation as those grains, makes it a bit easier. And so this is a plagioclase rim down here, and you can see it in this position here. And there's things like tainite, which are an iron alloy, plagioclase, olivine, low calcium pyroxene, high calcium pyroxene. So these are all minerals that are expected to be in chondrites. And so this is, uh, this is really good news. And there's a variety of other particles here. I'm not going to dwell on these, but uh, same sort of constituents, but also including a bit of mesostasis uh, or matrix, which is going to be quite interesting down the, down the track. Morphology, well, I suppose you can do X-ray tomography and you can show that these are derived from uh, something which has been fragmented, so the ratios of the axes and so forth tell you that sort of thing. Um, of more interest to me was the, was the chemistry, and so if you look at the iron-magnesium compositions, as we do for a lot of terrestrial minerals, for olivines and pyroxenes, the iron-magnesium ratio tells you about crystallisation sequences and so forth like that. The terrestrial mantle is down here, so it's immediately telling you that these are not from the terrestrial mantle. And plotted up here are HL and LL chondrite type uh, uh, compositions, and these things are bung up in here in the LL chondrite. And this diamond uh, is also. Um, oh, I haven't got the Itakawa one up there. That's a shame. So if this Itakawa is, uh, is actually the, uh, the one from the observation from the surf when they're in orbit but the particles all lie up in this region as well, so confirming that they, they actually do have that extraterrestrial origin. Oxygen isotopes, uh, anything from the Earth lies on this terrestrial fractionation line, these things are definitely offset, which is exactly what you expect for uh, LL chondrites, so everything's pointing towards that sort of a source, a uh, bit of trace element stuff. Uh, nickel, cobalt, iridium are, are classics for telling you that they're extraterrestrial and there's, some, there's a little bit of systematic behaviour in those as well for chondrules. But this is probably the best thing about this mission. It's like if, we got, if we'd gone up there and we brought back a meteorite sample, yeah, okay, it was successful, but it would have been somewhat disappointing. The whole point is to actually get a surface sample. And in hindsight, it was really good that those guns did not go off because these grains are actually accidentally entrained just by the, the horn hitting down on the surface. In a microgravity environment, they sort of float up and were captured. If we had shot a bullet into it, we would have got a sample of a meteorite. So in hindsight, it's always a good thing to justify it anyway, having these samples actually gave us access to the skin in a reasonably straightforward manner. And so you can look at these skins and you can see what space weathering is doing to them. And it turns out that these things had very low and they had incipient space, with space weathering. And that's compared with things like lunar grains from Apollo, from the Moon, where you can actually see these things have been destroyed from being there for hundreds and thousands of millions of years. So there's uh, a low degree of alteration, and that was very consistent with, with the noble gases. And so uh, probably the one to, to show you is this one here. So this is solar wind up here, and this is uh, air down here. And these grains are all lying very close to the solar wind. If you put something in space for a long period of time, and long geologically termed, you're going to get cosmogenic radionuclides producing cosmic rays going in there and smashing up atoms. And if you do that, you drag along this line here down to what's called cosmogenic neon. And so this gives you a, a time scale of, of how long this, been, this has been exposed in space. And it hasn't been exposed for very long at all. And the age of, of these, uh, of Itakara itself, is basically less than 10 million years. And so that's a very fresh surface. And there's all sorts of, there's a few explanations of what it is. I think the, the most obvious explanation is that basically this object was formed by the collision of two asteroids 10 million years ago. And these are the, the debris that's actually formed back at that time. And it's in this sort of uh, rather unstable sort of orbit down crossing Earth and Mars, where it's going to eventually be disrupted and, and sent on its way to the sun. So the sample results, these were all published in, in Science in a special volume last year. Uh, Itakawa is a, an LL parent body, it's a, it's a chondrite parent body, four or five represents how homogenised it is in terms of the, 
the chemical composition. So it's a reasonably homo homoge homogenized body. Um, so lots of variability in the, in the compositions that might have been in LL3, but it, it doesn't seem to be that. So it's largely equilibrated. The oxygen isotopes are, are consistent with that LL composition. The big thing is it's been re reasonably recently exposed to the solar wind. And if we were asked, I'm worried about the asteroids in the first place. Ordinary chondrites come from S-class asteroids. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. So, Hayabusa, the mission is complete. So I was in a meeting in December last year, they pulled the plug on it and that's Hayabusa 1 done with, but of course you can't have Hayabusa 1 without Hayabusa 2. And so Hayabusa 2 is, uh, is, is also a, a local asteroid and that's a, so the mission is to visit another near-Earth object, this guy, this, this guy called 1999JU3, which is a C-type asteroid, so get this SC thing sorted out. It's uh, slightly bigger, 900 metres in, uh, in diameter, rotation period is seven and a half hours and the launch date is around 2014 so everything's sort of building ahead but of course finance is an issue and so they're, they're sort of a little bit worried about whether they can actually afford to do it. Hayabusa in Japan, you wouldn't believe the cultural event that this actually was. So there's huge media cover, uh, coverage, there's a big popular response to it and if you go to, the, to JAXA there's all sorts of things like this, there's little knitted Hayabusa dolls and, and cardboard ones and Lego ones and it's, it's tremendous. There was, a, there was a big popular response so they, they're very much in behind us and so uh, when I was there for one of these meetings the, the Japanese government uh, decided that it would re-budget and so they took Hayabusa out of one pocket and were going to put it into another one but basically they left it unfunded for a, a month or, or thereabouts and so there was a, you know, everybody's, oh no, you know, what have you done to Hayabusa? But it's, you know, and there's, there's now three movies, so one of them's been released and viewed, I think the second one must be, is very soon, if not just recently, and then there's another one going to be, goes out next year, so it's like the, the three stories of Hayabusa. So in Japan it's very widely regarded as, as the, the little spacecraft that could, and uh, it, it's just been a tremendous sort of mission, so uh, it's, it's been a privilege to be associated with it, the, the JAXA dies did an absolute tremendous job on it and so they run it on a shoestring. The whole mission cost about $250 million and considering that if you try to launch anything in the US it's $150 million or thereabouts just to get up into orbit. And so they, they do run this on a shoestring, they run it on the seat of their pants but they do it incredibly well and they, they did a tremendous job for this one. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.